Greetings. Welcome to week two of Confidently Speak to Influence. Last week, you heard all about why people fear public speaking in presentations. Well, that begs the question, now that we know why, how do you overcome it? What do I do to manage these fears? That's the topic of today's presentation. So let's jump right in. A common question I get, especially from newer speakers and presenters, is how do I get rid of my nerves, Michael? Well, my answer to people surprises them. I tell them, you don't get rid of your nerves. What you want to do is learn how to manage your nerves, manage your fear. Big difference. So I believe that if you don't have any nerves or anxiety when you give a presentation, there's something wrong. It means you don't care, you're not engaged, something's off. The anxiety and the fear, if you manage them, can give you energy so you're a better presenter for your audience. Before you hear the first step of managing your fear, I must warn you that this next slide is the worst pun that I will ever share. I like to tell people that when you feel afraid or nervous or you feel chicken about speaking, employ the PEEP process. I know it's the worst one you'll hear. I promise this is as low as it gets with the, the humor. But what is this PEEP process? The PEEP process is prepare, exercise, engage, and prayer. Let's break each of these down. If you want to manage 75% of your nerves, be prepared every time you walk in to give a presentation. And what does that mean exactly? Preparation can have all kinds of different definitions. I have an eight step process for preparation. The first is to write your material out. Some people I work with say, Michael, I just like to come off the cuff. That's when I do my best work. I question how effective your message is getting across to your audience. What I love to help people to encourage them, I do this myself, is get everything out on paper or get it out on a computer screen. I'm 20th century, I was a child of the 1970s, so I like to use a pen and paper. Something about writing ideas out gets them out of my head, but use a computer, whatever works for you. Get all of your ideas out, and then you begin to formulate them into an outline. Once you have your outline and you have some semblance of order, now start to read it out loud. One of the biggest challenges I see for newer presenters is that they often speak the way they write and they don't speak the way they speak in everyday conversation. So it sounds like they're reading a novel and the problem with that is it doesn't feel authentic to audiences. So we want to speak to our audiences conversationally. That's why it's important to read it out loud. The next step is to make some adjustments. Once you've listened to yourself reading it out loud, you're going to very quickly find sentences or even paragraphs where you're going to think, you know, I don't really talk that way. How would I say this in everyday conversation? Make those adjustments and then read it out loud again. At this point, you're now ready to do a live presentation in front of other people. How many times should you read it out loud and adjust before you give it to an audience? I like to do it at least five times, just so I can start to get a feel for the rhythm. Then go do it in front of an audience. Now, don't just speak in front of the audience and leave. There are a couple of things I suggest you do. Number one is record yourself. I know what a lot of people tell me, Michael, ah, gosh, I just, I hate to listen to myself on audio or I hate to watch myself. It's just so embarrassing. I'm going to share the wisdom that my coach gave me when I made the mistake of telling him, I don't like to hear myself on, on audio, Darren. He said, well, really, you don't like to listen to yourself? That's really too bad. Well, guess what? We had to listen to you. <laughs> it's a great line. It's very funny. But below that, there's a lot of truth. I mean, really, you, you, you're asking other people to listen to you, but you won't listen to yourself? You're asking a lot of them. We have to be willing to do that. And the side benefit of that is that you get a, you grow a lot faster. So listen to your, record yourself, listen to those recordings, and also I guess I started over here. I said there are two things you want to do. First of those is record your presentation. The first of those is to record your presentation. I know what you may be thinking. I don't like to watch myself. I don't like to listen to myself. 
you know, I made the mistake of saying, uh, telling that to my coach early on and he had a great response. He said, really, Michael, you don't like to listen to yourself, huh? You don't like to watch yourself on video. I said, oh no, absolutely not. He said, well, that's really too bad. Well, guess what? We had to listen to you. I love the response. It's hilarious and it's also quite true. I mean, really, you, you want to go out there and share your message with or you want them to listen to you, you want them to watch you, but you're not willing to listen or watch yourself. Not a good situation. The side benefit of this is your growth comes a lot faster. When people give you feedback and you've heard it or you've watched it on video, that feedback will make more sense to you. So the, you definitely want to record yourself, watch and listen. And here's a tip early on in the speech creation process. Personal preference, I, I prefer to audio myself. I don't want to watch myself because what I'm trying to do is get the material down. I want to make sure the message is getting across, the support points are doing their job, I've got a compelling opening and conclusion. I'm only listening for the words in the beginning. At a certain point, I'll pull the video camera out and start videoing. That's just a personal preference, do what works best for you. Here are four quick tips on how to best review your recordings. Number one is to listen only, listen for the message. But don't just listen to yourself, listen to the sounds in the room. Is the audience coughing? Do you hear people shifting in their chairs? Can you hear paper rustling? Can you hear muttering? Or do you hear silence? What you're listening for hopefully is that silence because you know when it's silent, you've got their attention. All the other sounds are sending you a message that you don't have 100% attention. That's the first thing you do, listen to it. Then watch it with the sound down. Just see how you look on stage. How are you moving? Look for distracting mannerisms. Once you've watched it at regular speed, now watch it at double speed. Why do you do this? Because your distracting mannerisms will leap off the video. You've listened to it. You've watched it, you've watched it at double speed. Now go back and watch it as an audience member. Try to, as much as, as much as you can, turn off your speaker hat and say, if I was an audience member and I'd never seen this person before, what's the message? What do I like? What's confusing about it? Ask those questions. And since I mentioned those questions, this brings me to point number six, ask for specific feedback every time you speak. When you've got a live audience in front of you, hand them an evaluation sheet and ask them. And I like those three questions. What's my message? What did you like? What was confusing? So often as presenters, we put together ideas. We're so close to our material. We think we know what's the most powerful aspect, but we don't really know until we get an audience to tell us. So when you ask those questions, what's my message? If they're giving you the consistent same answer, then you know you're hitting the mark. They're getting the point. But if they're all over the place, you're not being clear. If you're getting the same answers on what do they like, well, then you need to keep that in. There may be parts of the talk that they like that were an afterthought for you. You almost didn't put it in. If the audience is telling you they like it, it has to become more important in the talk. And then lastly, if, if they're confused, if you're seeing some parts that are consistently confusing, you've definitely got to go in and fix that. But definitely ask for specific feedback. Always review your recording and your, your feedback, as I mentioned before, I should, should, told you how to do that. When you're listening to the recording, keep in mind the feedback you've gotten. A good example of this is sometimes I will suggest to my clients that they pause longer. And they'll say, Mike, I did pause. I'll say, well, let's go watch the video. If I just say that, they may not believe me, but if they hear that feedback and then go watch the tape or watch the video and see that, oh yeah, I didn't really give them time to think. The, the feedback makes more sense, it's more impactful to them. And that's why it's so critical to go back and review the, the recordings after you've gotten feedback. And the last part of this step eight is what I call the old joke about rinse, wash and repeat. <laughs> Do this process over and over again until the time of your presentation. Keep doing this over and over again. That's how you will be prepared and you'll feel much more confident in control and a lot less anxious when you step on stage. Now this leads to the question, how much should I prepare? 
there's a number that has come into my life in the last couple of years that I've heard consistently from professional speakers and successful amateur speakers. The best way I can explain this is to share a story that I experienced last year. I was part of a team that was working with a woman named Sherry Sue. Sherry was competing in Toastmasters World Championship of Public Speaking. She won her semifinal round. And if you're not familiar with this competition, think uh, The Voice, American Idol, these contests that have several levels. Toastmasters is six levels. It starts with 30,000 people. It comes down to the final, at that time, it was the final 100 people in the world. Sherry had won her semifinal, so now she was going to be one of the final 10. The night before her contest, I was one of four people that was watching Sherry practice her story. It was a good story. After when she was done, we gave her seven different suggestions, tweaks, if you will, to her talk. And then we followed that with, look, Sherry, this is the night before the contest. If you, if you don't feel comfortable changing these, we understand, but these are some tweaks you could consider, maybe insert one or two. She said, excuse me, give me 10 minutes and I'll be back. She walked over to a different corner of the room. It was a, a large auditorium we were in. You could see that she was practicing her speech. She came back after 10 minutes and she said, okay, I'm ready. Okay, she gave it again. And she had incorporated all seven changes. I looked at the other coaches and we were stunned. I said, Sherry, how many times have you practiced this talk? She said, well, I know it's at least 200. Aha, magic formula. That is the number that I've had professional speakers tell me over and over again. The number of times they practice their speeches before they get in front of an audience to collect a paycheck. It, it works for professionals. It worked in competition speaking. Sherry had practiced her semifinal speech 300 times. So that's the magic number, 200 times. Am I telling you that you should not go speak until you practice 200 times? No, it's preferable, but that's the goal you should shoot for. If you've been given a talk, a 30 minute talk in the next two weeks, it may be tough to do it 200 times, but do it as many times as you can to get close to that 200 number. Then when that talk is over, keep practicing. Because if it's a good talk, other people want to hear it. You'll have other opportunities. But that's the goal to shoot for, 200 times. In Sherry's case, you may be asking, was it worth it to her? Well, the next day, Sherry competed and she finished second in the world out of 30,000 people in the 2018 World Championship of Public Speaking. And she went home to her home country of China and she was a rock star. She is helping open up new avenues in China for Toastmasters to spread the word and gain traction and, and create more clubs. So it was definitely worth the effort for Sherry. She has become very popular in her native country. Now that you've prepared, that's the first P and PEEP. The first E is exercise. Now this can mean exercise of any type, whatever works best for you and your physical condition. I've recommended that people do push-ups, squats, and what would be roughly called dancing in this guy's case. Uh, I've done all of these about 15 to 20 minutes before I go on a stage. It's best if you can go to a side room, you can be by yourself. I've suggested this to people and seen them drop on the floor right there in a hallway and do push-ups. The reason I suggest exercise is even if you've prepared, you're still going to have some anxiety and some nerves building up before the big talk. Again, don't want to get rid of all those, but you might have a, a, some excess. This will help burn some of that off and it gets your body ready in a peak state physically to so start moving and be dynamic. So try some exercise. The second E in PEEP is engage. I don't mean run out and get engaged because that'll increase the anxiety and stress, the pressure. I mean, engage with your audience out in the hallways or anywhere in the meeting place before you go into the auditorium if possible. Shake hands with people, smile, get to know them. You may not have much time. It might be something as simple as, hi, I'm Michael. I'm the speaker today. So glad you're here. Look forward to talking. It could be something that simple, but find people, engage them. And here's why this is important, especially if you're speaking to a group that you know nobody. 
when you're looking at people in the audience who you've spoken with, you've shaken their hands, you just have, you said hi and you've smiled, they're no longer strangers to you and you're not a stranger to them. This increases the likelihood that they'll be engaged with you while you're speaking. And remember, they want you to do well. You've prepared, you've exercised, and you've engaged the audience. What's the fourth part of PEEP? Prayer. Prayer is a catch-all word I used here because it, it involves some inner dialogue, talking to whoever you need to talk to, your, your beliefs, and also begins with the letter P, which is great for fitting with my awful pun of PEEP, right? Pulling your curtain back and just telling you the whole truth and being authentic. But here are a couple of suggestions for you. The first one is from my coach, Craig. Before he goes on stage, I mean, literally the moment before he steps in front of an audience, this is what he says to himself. And I've used this and I love it. Please help me remember my speech, forget myself, and focus on the audience. It's all about focusing on the audience. Love that. It just helps me get in that right frame of mind, reminding me who I'm there for. The second type of prayer that I use is actually a series of four questions. I got this from my buddy, Darren, who's also a coach. First question he asks is, why am I here? What's my purpose? And a good answer to that question is not because I'm getting this really nice check or because what an opportunity to sell my book. Er, not a good answer. It's there to provide a message to the audience, to give them hope, to give them some tidbit on how they can live their lives a little bit better. Second question, am I present? Am I here mentally and emotionally in the room? I know I am physically. Am I thinking about my sick puppy at home or my son who's struggling with work or the incident that I have with my partner, whatever. Am, am I here with the audience or am I thinking about those other issues? And if I'm thinking about those other issues, I need to get my mind straight and focus on the audience. Remember Craig's prayer, help me focus on the audience. Number three, will I have fun? Believe it or not, if you're newer to this, you can actually have fun when you're presenting. It's much more likely that you'll have fun if you're prepared and you've exercised, you've engaged the audience and you're in this great frame of mind, that's going to increase the likelihood that you'll have fun. The fourth question is the most powerful. Darren actually got this from Hall of Fame speaker, Willie Jolly. How would I give this presentation if I knew it would be my last one ever? Think about that. One of these days, you and I will give our very last presentation. There's a good chance we won't know it at the time that it's our last presentation. Since we don't really know if it'll ever be our last one, why don't we treat each one as if it will be? How are you going to present differently if you walk in with that mindset? Give them everything you've got, just in case that's the last message you ever get to give. So those are the four questions, and I highly recommend you use those. I ask them five minutes before I go up on stage. So you've prepared, you've exercised, you've engaged the audience, and you've done your prayer. Is there anything else you can do? Actually, there is. I've started doing this in the last several months. One of my clients actually taught me this. He's also a storytelling and leadership coach, and he's a dynamic presenter. He's hardcore. I mean, he goes all in for every talk, and he taught me more uh, better breathing techniques. But rather than show you videos, I'm just going to do a live demonstration here for you. Two types of breathing. Number one is the quick in and out or the diaphragmatic breathing where you breathe in through your diaphragm. And the way you'll know if you're doing it correctly is your shoulders won't go up. A lot of people breathe like this. That's not good. Breathe to where your belly's coming out. Belly's out. Shoulders stay down. You try to stay relaxed here. Do that 10 times in and out quickly. And what's interesting is you will actually start to get lightheaded. It's almost like, for lack of a better term, you're buzzed. <laughs> it's because it's a quick injection of, of oxygen into your system and your body's not used to that. That's the first way. The second is more deliberate. And that's where you take four, a four second breath in, you hold it for four seconds and you breathe out for six. Not being a healthcare specialist, I can only go by what I've read, but the reason we breathe in for four and hold it for four is we obviously want to get the oxygen into our bodies and get that circulating through our, our uh, circulatory system. And we let it out for six because there's this excess buildup of carbon dioxide. We want to get that out of our systems. 
So just do the four, four, six rule. I like to do that 10 times. Try these breathing exercises. They help oxygenate your system. And I found it to be helpful to make me more alert. I realize I've just given you a lot there as far as uh, the, the pre-speech routine, as far as exercise and meeting people. The idea here is pick two. I, I try to do all of these. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll exercise 15 to 20 minutes before. I'll do deep breathing about 10 minutes before. I will ask those four questions that Darren asks five minutes before. And then right before I go on stage, I do Craig's prayer. It seems like a lot at first. Don't try to do all these at once. Incorporate one at a time into your routine. Use the ones that work for you. Throw the rest out. I've got one bonus tip for you. This is one that I created. It's based on observation that I've had over the years that in order to stand in front of a group of people and give a speech, you've got to have an ego. You have to think you've got something important to say. Now, on the flip side of that coin, it's important to remind ourselves that as hard as we work on our speech, as important as we think our topic is, we are only one part of an event. And oh, by the way, if you and I weren't on that stage speaking, somebody else would be. So the way that I keep my ego in check is I like to wear funky socks. <laughs> it's all about the socks. I've got socks that have Star Wars on them. I've got dolphins. I've got sports, sporting events. I've got tacos. I mean, the craziest socks I can find, I will buy. And what I do when I'm in the middle of that 15 to 20 minute warm up routine that I have, I will a couple of times glance down at my socks as a reminder that, hey, it's not about me. It's about them out there. So this combination of, of preparation, exercise, engagement, um, breathing, prayer, all of this, plus glancing down at my socks helps me to stay very focused on the people that I'm there to serve. To recap, if you want to manage your nerves, not get rid of them. Again, we never want to get rid of them completely because with no f nervousness or anxiety, we may, we've got an issue because we're not there for the audience. We're not giving our all. We want some of that. But in order to get that to a manageable, a manageable level, use the PEEP process. Prepare, 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 because that will take care of 75% of your nerves. Once you're at the venue and it's getting close to time for you to speak, exercise, get rid of some of that excess energy. Engage the audience. Again, when you're speaking to people who are no longer strangers, they're more likely to pull for you. They want you to succeed because you're a friendly face. And also prayer. What can you ask? What questions can you ask to get you focused on the audience? Next, make sure that you're breathing properly. Make sure that you're properly oxygenating your blood because more oxygen makes you more alert, more focused. And finally, put on some funky socks or whatever clothing you can quickly glance at to remind you that it's not about you, it's about the audience. I hope this has been helpful in helping you manage your fear of public speaking. Again, don't try to do all of this at once. Slowly incorporate these into your routine. It may take six to 12 months, but once you do this and it becomes a habit, you'll find that you feel so much more confident so much more at ease and so much more focused on your audience. As I mentioned last week, one of the keys to effective public speaking, whether you're giving presentations one-on-one -on -one to sales prospects, you're leading your team or you're out in your community giving talks, one of the keys is effective storytelling. If you'd like to go deeper into the topic of storytelling and learn how to sell more with your stories, then I've got a webinar coming up in one week. It is called How to Sell More with Stories. And in this program, you're going to pick up ideas on, first of all, why stories are your best communication tool. Second, you'll learn the seven keys to creating memorable stories. And third, you'll pick up the most powerful storytelling formula that sells, not just a product or service, but your idea. Again, this is a complimentary webinar. It offers you world-class insights uh, that I've picked up from some of the top presenters, uh, speakers, 
even a Hollywood scriptwriting consultant and a Las Vegas headliner. They've all given me a unique perspective on storytelling. That's what you'll pick up in this webinar. So if you'd like to join us, it's Friday, November 15th at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. You can register at this link and I will also put a, a clickable link below this video. Because of the Sell More With Stories webinar, I will not be doing one in this series for two weeks. But in two weeks, do join me because we'll talk about how to create meaningful material. We'll show you a step-by-step -step process. We'll at least start that in a couple of weeks. It'll probably take a good six to eight weeks to go through this, but you'll know how to create material that sticks with your audience and leaves a meaningful and memorable message. Hope to see you on the storytelling webinar. If not, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.